Hey everyone, um, thanks for joining us today. So we have Mauricio and um, I've known him for a long time. We actually went to Art Center together. Um, and yeah, this is gonna be a really great session. Thanks for signing on and I'll hand it over to him. Thanks, Angela. Uh, hey everyone and hey everybody, one, everybody watching from uh, home after the fact in the recording. My name is Mauricio Abril. I also go by Mao and uh, Mao Artists Online on Instagram. And yes, thank you so much for having me to the uh, Warrior Painters and uh, everybody um, sharing their time. So I am an upcoming teacher with Warrior Art Camp and I'm here to talk a little bit about my work as well as uh, hopefully help uh, give a new perspective to some of you who uh, are either aspiring illustrators, already working, uh, about painting process, about character illustration. That's sort of my my bread and butter and what I love to do. And so, yeah, um, I am an illustrator, a concept artist, a teacher, but most importantly, I am a pizza lover. So, all right, let's... Uh... Okay, so as I, as I mentioned, I will be teaching an upcoming class with uh, Warrior Art Camp Character Illustration. But in addition to being a teacher, I do a lot of things. I work in the fields of illustration. I work in concept art, children's books, animation, and of course, teaching. So this is just a quick overview. We'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit uh, more of an in-depth talk about some of the uh, uh, specific uh, industries I work in. So with regard to illustration, Right, what, what I sort of refer to as illustration, because I think it can mean a lot of different things to different people, is illustration for me is, is the work I do where the actual end product of what I do, the artwork, is uh, customer facing, consumer facing, right, forward facing. So the work that I do, the public sees, that is the product that is being asked of me, as opposed to something like concept art, where most of the time, the work you do is behind the scenes. It can range from, you know, anything from rough scribble sketches to rough, you know, color paintings to full renders. But um, in this case, I've been fortunate enough to work on a variety of different projects, different styles. So in the upper left, you'll see the Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart cover, which I designed. So what you're seeing there is the CG composite. But what happens is they hire artists to design the cover and sort of workshop it. So I was hired and I came up with different, um, you know, thumbnail concepts, you know, black and white sketches. And then once we got one approved, I sort of worked on it in color and then did a full 2D uh, illustration. And then once that is done, they had, you know, they pass it along the chain and then they get their CG artist to make the cover for, you know, the actual video game, for billboards, for uh, posters. Uh, so that was really fun. The Disney princesses, I got to do a project for Hot Topic, which unfortunately uh, got canceled, not due to me or the people at Hot Topic, but Disney themselves is sort of uh, internally, there's a lot of big stuff happening um, with the departments in the last year or two. So that project unfortunately got a, uh, got a, uh, got sort of shelved. Um, on the bottom right, you'll see some t-shirts. Uh, uh, that's one t-shirt I designed for Hot Topic as part of the creator program. So I had like this uh, theme of space, so you can sort of buy them off of the Hot Topic website. So again, very different style than anything else. And then the Cowboy Bebop, uh, that's in reference to this year. Uh, they had the 25th anniversary of Cowboy Bebop, the iconic anime from the 90s. And so I was hired by Crunchyroll to design a couple of posters and artwork that would be used for the opening of the show at the Comic-Con Museum in San Diego. So that's myself on the bottom, on the left, my friend Chris, whose posters are there as well on the right. And uh, the artwork would be used by them for anything and everything, right? So what I ended up doing, they asked me to, for a couple of posters, they asked me for a team shot, and then they asked me for a Spike versus Andy. If you know, if you're familiar with Cowboy Bebop, um, you'll hopefully get these sort of references here. If not, I highly recommend watching. It is, it's one of the, in my opinion, one of the greatest just things ever made. Um, but this highlights kind of what I love to do, uh, what my class character illustration is about. It's it's about character illustration, right? It's, um, you know, I'll, I'll go over this a little bit more, but it's it's not just 
you know, portraiture and it's not exactly a key scene or a, an environment piece, right? It's sort of like bringing to life characters with, with everything that we have at our disposal as artists, our, um, our, our you know, drawing, our composition, uh, color and light, as well as staging. So uh, all of that is at play. And here you'll see that, like, I also, they asked me to design a, an illustration of um, Ein, the uh, corgi from the show. Uh, and the, and Box Lunch, uh, well, because Box Lunch works with Funimation and Crunchyroll, they, uh, they worked to sort of, I didn't know they were going to do this, but they created, they turned it, uh, they appropriated that art into a uh, product, into a, uh, a bag. And so I thought that was super cool. Uh, but again, it's uh, for me, the, the heart of all of this is an understanding character and story right it's not just about drawing well or sort of painting well it's really about capturing emotion with 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 every element that you do so in like this case there is no background it's sort of like you know taking different vignettes of ein from the show and, and designing them in an interesting composition and then it works for you know multiple multiple levels uh same thing here i did a a, a character uh, rendering for uh this uh, brand mr Corey's cookies this is the uh the it's a sort of a this kid started his own cookie brand and uh and that's him uh cory so i was hired by this uh this advertising brand to design the character so that they can put it on packaging in animation um I, I most recently worked at WB on the Batman Cape Crusader show. Unfortunately, I can't show that just yet because it'll be out, um, I believe, next year on Amazon Prime. I worked at, uh, as a background painter uh, on that show and then uh, as a background painter on Victor and Valentino for Cartoon Network. These are just a couple of the backgrounds that uh, I did. Um, very cool style. I love the sort of like flat graphic, but with like texture and, and, uh, and gradients. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I worked in I work in children's books. So uh, these these books I did I worked uh, solely as an illustrator. I was hired to be the illustrator. Um, you know, and and in the case of the Abominable books from DreamWorks, uh, the DreamWorks movie, they uh, I was sort of given. You know, they're following the movie, but the funny thing about that is that I wasn't really given. Uh, you know, they're they're. they're we worked on them before the movie's released so that they can, the books can be released with the movie. So I didn't have access to like exactly what the movie looked like other than just some character model sheets and maybe some, some simple environment references. So it was my job to sort of like design these shots, uh, you know, think how could they look interesting from a compositional point of view? What, what are the characters going to be posed like, you know, what exactly, um, you know, uh, are their facial expressions. And it was very fun to sort of see the final movie, then kind of see what my uh, compositions look like, you know, because I'll be given a prompt saying, you know, these three characters, uh, you know, meet Everest on the rooftop. And so I'm, and I'm also trying to make it super simple for kids books versus like, you know, if you're working as a visual development artist on a feature animated film, you're sort of a, uh, encouraged and required to make it as dynamic as possible so it's a very uh, interesting sort of mental uh, trick to do as an artist and now uh, i'm actually uh, my first official children's book that i wrote and illustrated is coming out funny enough in just a few weeks uh, january 16th it's called program to paint um, coincidentally you know uh, we're all painters here so it's about a little robot who uh, struggles to find his creativity and enrolls in an art class with uh, some fellow kids and a, and a patient teacher and learns to find his own style and, instead of being so uh, robotic and focused on making everything perfect so um, that's that's super uh, you know a big part of what I, I love to do I love storytelling I love character and, and drawing all the pages from that book you know, requires, again, what I really like to do, which is character illustration, right? It, it's, um, you know, uh, I'll expand upon that uh, in just a little bit. But, and I just want to share uh, some of my personal work because I feel like for, for myself, my personal work is what helped me find my own voice and then also pivot my career a little bit more into the types of work that I like to do and that I would say that I'm, you know, better at than 
other aspects that I can do, right? Um, going to art school, it's it's very, you know, I think it's natural to sort of want to try to do everything the best you can, right? Environments, props, um, you know, organic things, uh, mechanical things, uh, cartoony things, realistic things. And uh, doing my personal work was what helped me sort of find my voice. So some of these images you'll see like uh, are, are just sort of more uh, you know fan art based, uh, but I bring I like to bring my own voice and perspective to these uh, concepts. So like in this case, right, I was uh, I I was this was a submission for a, actually a, a a gallery show that was supposed to be the theme of the gallery show was to blend pop culture with video games. So uh, I sort of randomly chose Sonic, maybe not randomly, but I like Sonic, but, you know, I chose Sonic, I could have chosen Mario or, you know, Zelda, but I chose Sonic and I thought, okay, well, he's, he's a speedster, you know, he's fast, you know, how do I blend that with pop culture? So then I thought, okay, well, you know, in pop culture, the two of the fastest characters are Superman and the Flash. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if, if he was racing Superman and the Flash? And my original idea was to sort of have Sonic in the foreground, Superman and the Flash behind him and Sonic sort of beating them and maybe looking back, kind of smiling. And I and and that, that could have worked too. I don't think that's that's a bad idea. But then I got the idea to sort of restage it, have it be at the starting line, the moment before, you know, the gun shoots, and also prop it in such a way where you're just focused on Sonic. It's it's sort of his story. We get that it's Flash. We get that it's Superman, right? We have enough information to tell us that we don't need to see their faces. And if anything, you know, this really, what what I've noticed is when people react to this online, um, you know, the comments are typically like, you know, Sonic is like, I got this, right? And and so it just sort of invites people to, you know, ask. So it's it's sort of like instead of giving them the action, I'm giving them the moment right before the action. Right. And, and then it's sort of in that case for this particular piece, I feel like it's stronger because of that, because it invites um, the viewer to participate a little bit more with that. And so that's what I love to do with my work, um, with my classes. Uh, in this case, this was my tribute to Halloween. Right. The idea that, uh, you know, I, I whenever I do dress up, I love the idea that it's like you are that character. Right. You can forget about yourself for a night. And in this case, you know utilizing the environment to my my benefit with the shadows but if it you know also thinking as an illustrator how do we make this pop how do we make this magical right if this was just shadows without the color pops of the lightsaber you know elsa's uh cape thing and superman's cape it wouldn't be as fun of an illustration so it's sort of like um really sort of learning to be your own art director uh, which is something that I think all artists need to do, even if they don't want to ever be an art director, because I don't think that's for everybody. Uh, a lot of meetings um, and a lot of headache. I'm sure uh, Angela can speak to that. I've done a little bit of art direction in the past, and I definitely enjoy just being a background painter more often than not. Um, and and then a couple of other things. So yeah, uh, this was my uh, comment on Spider-Man getting to join the MCU, which feels like forever ago when he was just more of a Sony movie property. But I'm sharing these because these were the ones that sort of were a big hit online. People love them. It just, it, 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 it strikes an emotional chord, which is what I, I try to do with my work all the time. And I feel like that's what, you know, for me makes my voice unique. Everybody's different, right? Some people, it could be a more visual style that makes their work unique. Uh, some people it could be more of like a point of view, like what they're choosing to focus on. Um, but, you know, with with regard to like what I how I like to blend all these things, right, like in this piece, you know, if you sort of notice like the composition is designed in such a way where there's a flow from, you know, each character's gaze to their pose and it leads to the other, you know, but it's still fun. It's still cute. It's like even if you're a lay person, you're not an artist and you're you know, you see this, you can enjoy it. But the the uh, the architecture of the piece is is what makes it work and what makes it strong as a as just a two-dimensional um assortment of of shapes and colors and then you know something not ip based but just kind of thinking about how do you know the attribute to kids imagination a lot of my work sort of leans towards um you know imagination fun 
uh, childhood and uh, and in this case, you know, kids pretending to be pirates and then having the uh, the uh, the ship made of clouds in the back. And then a lot of storytelling too, like um, like in this illustration, I wanted to uh, I just got the idea to do like um, like a uh, like a an all girl witch academy and they're in like a potions class or something like that and and everybody's getting it but you know the one character that we're focused on you know it seems like she's not getting it or she's very insecure or unsure about what she's doing hence her little small purple trail compared to everybody else's and you know their emotional uh facial reactions compared to hers which feels very um upset and worried and in a, again, just another way to do that. Uh, this was uh, my illustration that was sort of my love letter to music and the fact that music can make us feel like we did when we first heard the song or just from, uh, you know, or, or just from a different point in our lives. Like, you know, even if it's not a specific memory, but just a certain phase. So uh, again, in this case, what I what I love in terms of way i try to do things is you know it's not just characters right like like this illustration wouldn't work if it was just um a vignette of of the man and the couple the young couple as just against the white background or against just like a color uh, a solid color background like it you need to see the like the 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 the, the um not benches the um the seats, you need to see the seats, you need to see the counter, right? You need to see the jukebox, you need to see a little bit of light and, and behind the bar, uh, the diner, whatever it is, uh, not a bar, uh, the diner that uh, that gives you that sense of, you know, he's remembering, but it's not important enough to for me to paint the entire uh, diner behind them because that would be, you know, overkill, right? So again, being that, um, that self-editor, that self-art director, uh, is is uh, super important. And as I mentioned, uh, I'm also uh, a teacher. I love teaching. I've been teaching since 2015, so several years now. Uh, most recently with Warrior Art Camp. In the past, I've also taught at Art Center, digital painting there. Uh, I also went to Art Center, which is where I met Angela. I've also taught with CGMA and Brainstorm as well. You know, I love online teaching because it you get to work with so many people from around the world, and that's really cool. Like having students in Europe and Asia and and the East Coast of the US and South America. Uh, but I definitely miss in person. Um, uh, just, you know, there's a fun energy with uh, getting to interact with people in person. So speaking of, of teaching, right, I'm, I'm, I'll be teaching the upcoming character illustration class. And w something I just wanted to, you know, point out about this class, because I'm super passionate about it, you know, it's almost uh, a bit easy to, easier to define uh, at first what it's not, right? W I just want to make sure people are, are you know, fully uh, understanding that it's not a character rendering class, right? Like, these are two characters that I, I painted um, for different uh, purposes. You know, these are just essentially character renderings, right? We're, we're just communicating you know, texture, we're communicating form. There's typically not a background. Maybe it's a simple background or a just a plain white background, right? That's cool. Nothing wrong with that. But that's not necessarily what this class will be about. This class is going to be more like this. It's going to be about illustrating characters where the character is the focus, but it's also about how the environment and supplementary information supports it. It's not so much a necessarily it, it doesn't have to be a keyframe right we, we don't have to necessarily make it where the environment is super big and the character super tiny or anything like that but it's 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 something where you know we want to push our storytelling skills and use you know good drawing and good painting and good composition to help you know really drive the emotional aspect of of what our goal is so another way i like to do think about it is uh, and this is something I do with all my classes, uh, just so that I help students um, sort, of, sort of think about how they're approaching the class. So if we take like the average art education and I break it down into three components, I sort of look at it like this, drawing, painting, and design, right? So you got your drawing skills, which are your viscom skills. You know, can you just draw basic objects? Can you make them look like basic objects? Can you draw people, figures, characters, right? It's, it's, it's rare 
that you're never going to have to draw a figure character unless you're totally devoted to like landscape uh, or like environment. Uh, you got your perspective skills, right? Can you draw environments and then comp composition? Can you, how do you arrange the shapes on your image surface, right? In a pleasing manner. Then you got painting, got value and lighting, and then color. Pretty, pretty, pretty simple, right? Like, can we bring to life our drawings in an effective manner? And then you got your design skills. You got your design fundamentals, which we can think about as our, like our ABCs of design, right? Like, you know, what are the essences of shape design and sort of form language? And then sort of how good are you as a character designer, right? Can you draw more original characters? Uh, and how good are you uh, in designing your own environments with sort of your own unique style, right? We don't have to max out all of these, right? As if this was a video game. If you are maxed out on everything, like you're a beast, but uh, I don't think everybody needs to. Um, but for the purposes of, of the class that I'm doing and sort of like what I feel like it's going to help people with um, oops, is uh, going from, you know, if we look at this as just a blank slate, you know, the character illustration class that I'll be doing, I feel like will sort of cover these topics and in turn will help students advance in these elements. So, you know, we'll get better at figure character drawing. It's not a figure drawing class. So, of course, you know, we won't be spending too much time on how to draw figure character, but I'll definitely be, um, you know, helping with uh, pushing your figure character drawing skills in terms of posing, in terms of unique angles, in terms of how to think about, uh, you know, sketching and, and just uh, outlaying a character to then build upon that. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about perspective, but you know, hardly uh, because it's not really going to be about the environment as much. A ton of composition. You know, I feel like this class will will greatly help your sense of composition and how that will how the composition is tied to every part of the process, from the drawing to the value to the uh, color um, and even to the pose. Uh, painting definitely will, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a painting class, but we will go over a lot of painting fundamentals, just like, you know, when I was in art school, so many classes overlapped in a lot of categories, and that's important because you don't just take one class and then you're done with that, that topic, right? As far as design skills, I would say, you know, we'll probably, you'll probably get a little bit of benefit from your, uh, you know, in terms of character design, right? in terms of shape language and sort of improving your your drawing choices but again it's not a character design class so i wouldn't um uh, you know come into it expecting that we'll be like designing characters as much as we'll be improving upon the characters that you draw and making sure that they help tell the story as well as are visually appealing and the choices behind those so let's talk a little bit about my process i want to share kind of um, my mindset, I always feel like, you know, when I listen to artist talks and artists like guests, guess, you know, when I was in class, uh, a student listening to artists uh, give a guest lecture, I always love just sort of seeing how they problem solve, how they work through things as a little bit more than just seeing their, you know, cool art. Uh, so with this illustration that I, you know, already showed a little bit before, this is a, a bit of a fan art piece from uh, the show It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. There's a character there. Uh, he's not the brightest, um, you know, person, and, and he fancies himself a bird lawyer, which if you watch the show, it, it, it's, um, you know, it, it's funny just by even just saying it, bird lawyer. And so I thought it'd be funny to sort of contrast that aspect of his character with the idea that, you know, um, a really professional lawyer would have this really fancy office it have sort of that like, you know, very uh, East Coast um, uh, art style and art, uh, architecture and, and decor, and then have this like really nice kind of lighting that makes it feel like, you know, he's a hard worker, but really um, uh, he's not, he, he's very inept. And that's sort of, that contrast is what uh, uh, makes it funny. And if you're a fan of the show, right, because it's sort of, that's the audience for this piece, in addition to just hopefully making a nice illustration, would would sort of really love it and um and so how this piece came together 
was, you know, obviously I had a starting point, right? I had the starting point of the the character Charlie from the show. And he has he always wears the same outfit for when he's when he pretends to be a lawyer. And so I thought, okay, definitely have to, you know, use that the glasses. He he never wears glasses. He doesn't have to wear glasses. He chooses to wear glasses um, with the uh the little uh uh straps and the short leave, uh, short sleeved uh uh, button down shirt with the big tie and then I decided okay well I want to do this as an animated style portrait so I'm going to you know look at uh, popular common conventions for you know animated characters that sort of resemble you know his phenotype and then going to combine them with the environment and props that would bring this portrait to life so I thought okay well um, I want this to be a vertical composition I want there to be a, uh, you know, a lot of browns, a lot of warm tones, because I, I envisioned the office sort of being that kind of wooden oak kind of decor style. And then in the show, there is a portrait of a German shepherd that he has in his uh, apartment, which um, it's intentionally not supposed to be a good portrait. And I thought since he's a bird lawyer and he's sort of obsessed with birds, I should have a, a portrait of a bird behind him painted in the style of that portrait and then just to balance out the composition because without that little bird skeleton on the bottom left it would sort of feel very empty sure i could put something else there but i thought it'd be even more appropriate to put like a little bird skeleton and then you know polish it off with his uh nameplate which is misspelled because as part of his character he's also illiterate which makes the fact that he wants to be a lawyer uh that much more comical in the context of the show and so then ultimately, you know, design the sketch, design the composition, right? This is the first pass, sort of first block in, you know, when I, when I sort of block in my, my, uh, my work, I don't really worry about having it look soup, like having uh, it look uh, like one step below finish. Like one of the things as a, as an art student that always made me um, uh, sort of very self-conscious and just uh, like, Ha always got my mind blown was seeing uh, people's sketchbooks and the sketchbooks themselves were works of art like beautiful sketches and I'm like my sketchbooks always look like 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 chicken scratch like I'm working through ideas like oh that's a bad head I'm drawing another head that's a bad head um and and especially like seeing these demos online you know uh over the years uh and I might have just been the ones I saw in the like you know the ones that I came across but always felt like you know, seeing these awesome artists paint and it's sort of like, yeah, it's like starting really well. It's sort of like watching Bob Ross paint, like it's already just beautiful from the beginning. Um, but I sort of like, you know, feel like we have to problem solve at each step, yes, but not worry about having each step be 100% perfect. And uh, as you evolve the piece, so like you'll notice um, in my left sketch, right, I originally didn't have the the I, I kind of had the the portrait kind of be a little bit taller and then sort of like the uh the part of the wall that wasn't wood just goes up but then I thought well no you know probably better to cut that off actually bring the portrait down a bit uh and actually you know really see the end of that area that would be a little bit nicer also didn't like that um this bird skeleton it's a white head right it's a white object against a light background that's that's no good for um having it read so i scale that down so that the bird skeleton is framed uh, completely around you know the dark of the of the wood so little things like that i made the nameplate bigger make it you know made it like more animation um and then uh you know like played a little bit around with the proportions of the shirt right make it a little bit more comical so little things like that that I feel like were um uh just sharing a little bit about the process to like help uh people especially because one of the things that I've always like I said tin and like is feeling like seeing all these artists do amazing pieces from start to finish and it's like where's the where are the mistakes where are the where are the, the the course corrections right um so yeah hopefully there's definitely more uh, demos that that have really like complete change of uh change of directions midway so the other big thing about my work and, and what i love to push in my students work is concept and the relationship to composition so in this illustration right which i'll 
break down in a similar fashion to the bird lawyer piece, right? This is a back row uh, painting. And what it was, was it was supposed to be essentially a, a poster. It could be a cover. One of the things that I always encourage my students to do and to think about as they're developing their portfolios is if you've ever heard the phrase dress for the job you want, not for the job you have, right? So like if you want to be some kind of manager, but you're going to work dressed like, you know, um, just like a coordinator, you got to start dressing like a manager to sort of grow into that and be seen as that. Uh, you know, same thing with with uh, with with your portfolio, right? Make the art for the jobs you want, even if you don't have them yet. So, you know, doing the Cowboy Bebop posters made me really like doing more poster work. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna when I have time, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw more illustrations that can look like posters, not just fun illustrations that are just sort of like for Instagram or whatever, but something that could be a poster or a cover. So if you notice, I designed this with a lot of um, negative space so that like if this was a, a cover, you know, uh, for back row comic, you know, back row, the logo would go up here, you know, the uh, the barcode could go down here, the, the, the name credits could go here as well. So, you know, the little like comic symbol could go up there. So it's purposely designed in such a way where it could be both a poster or, um, a cover, right? And so that, that, that was the idea behind this piece uh, and why I sort of chose to do it. But I also love the character and I, and I wanted to do this very dynamic composition, right? And so uh, I played around with uh, two ideas, right? Uh, obviously one with the one on the right, but at first I also played with one of her sort of doing this sort of like backflip, you know, the city in the back. Uh, I, I knew I wanted a moon. Um, and I don't think the one on the left is a bad composition. I just really like the more dynamic aspect of the one on the right with the leg coming out at you and sort of like the idea of her um, leaping over uh, the ledge of a building about to, you know, go, uh, you know, to, to some action crime scene. And so that was, you know, the idea for me, you know, these are rough sketches that I would do for myself, right? If I was working with a client, like depending on who the client was and what level of comfort I had with them, I, I could maybe take these and clean them up just a little bit, but but you get the essence of the of the of the composition, right? For me, that's enough for to understand what's going on with the uh, the sort of the big shapes, the direction, the composition, what's the story, right? But I really like the one on the right, and I chose to just flip it in the end because. You know, we read left to right, and in this case, I really thought that would help more with the flow of the uh, of the piece to make it feel like like gravity is also helping our psychological impression of it. And so you can see on the left, I, I always like showing my my color comps. Like, what I like to do with color comps is like work on one layer, uh, maybe two if there's some weird element that is going to make working on one layer super complicated. But yeah, I pretty much just work on one layer just block in stuff, take my time. You know, I'm not going like just laying down things. I'm sort of just, just filling in shapes, like having fun, uh, using different brushes, but working on one layer to sort of create like a mood. And then what I like about working on one layer is I can then just, if I feel like I'm too washed out, I can uh, increase the levels or if it's too dark, I can lighten it. Uh, and instead of like, oh, the shoe's on one layer, the hair is on another layer, the hand is on one layer, right? Because what I'm just trying to do is I'm trying to find the piece uh, as a as a as a assortment of color and and uh, and value and light. So you know, and then of course from that you know finessing it, right? Deciding, okay, I'm going to really make the hair pop. Looking at reference for that, deciding, you know, the moon is too much of a circular object i'm going to add some uh clouds to break that up design the shape of the spire building in the background better and then of course like add just enough details for the city to make it feel like a city but not go overboard not paint things that i don't need to paint right i want to do all have all my attention focused on the character which is uh, the most important part and then thinking about overall color palette right it's back girl, she's got orange hair, she's got the yellow. So that's gonna be a really nice contrast. Those warms are gonna be a nice contrast against the pools of the 
uh, sky as well as the rest of the city. And then just a little bit of a warm gradient coming from the bottom right as the lights from the city below light her as she's uh, leaping over the ledge. Another uh, example of composition sort of being super important at the sketch stage, right? This was a little bit different. This is a Joan of Arc piece that I did as a demo for my art center class. Um, and the way it sort of was uh, started was originally with the sketch on the left. Now, I in this, I, I rarely sketch with um, value blocking. I love sketching with line and then, you know, adding tone to just make the sketch pop. But for this, for this, I was sort of demonstrating how to like think about, you know, composition with just blocky, uh, broad strokes with like this, you know, just flat charcoal brush I have. And so I came up with the composition on the on the left first. You know, I liked it. I, you know, I thought it was fine. But then I just thought, okay, it's not dynamic enough. It, it, it's it's sort of a long lens composition, right? We're we're farther away, and we're sort of head on, and we're looking at. Joan in the scene with like a telescopic lens. Um, and if you're familiar with perspective, you'll sort of know that like when you're far away and you're zooming in on something, it flattens the perspective. But when you're following more of a widescreen convention, if you're closer, you know, there's more um, distortion. And so I thought that's what I want for my piece. So then on top of that piece, I just started scribbling and drawing over and sort of uh, came up with the sketch on the right, which sort of makes you, uh, puts the viewer, you know, more in the scene. We're on the ground, we're looking up at Joan. You know, I even drew that like circle uh, line above her just because that was helping me to force myself to remember that the perspective is looking up. And so, yeah, that's, that's how I ended up uh, you know, uh, evolving uh, this piece to to you know where it ultimately ended up uh, landing, and and uh, just again, just a little bit of a insight into the process. And you know, in this case, like the characters in the background, the, the soldiers, right? We don't need to worry about their anatomy too much or like exact shapes. Like we just need to have blobs make us feel like okay, there's soldiers in the background, and. Uh, and and that's that's the more important uh, thing is to focus on the main character. So you know, last but not least, finishing and polishing, right? So uh, if you're familiar with Star Wars, especially the uh, original trilogy, there's a character called Salacious Crumbs, like this little rat-looking character that hangs out with Jabba the Hutt. Um, I I, <laughs> I always thought he was funny just because he's like just like a nothing character in, in the grand scheme of the universe, but there's something just funny about him. So I thought, what if I uh, paint him in a way that like, in, in like his natural habitat uh, on whatever planet he's from. And uh, so it's, it's almost like a, like a uh, nature, like a planet earth type of shot. And so, so that was the idea behind this portrait. And, uh, you know, it, one of the things that I, like, you, you know, just like any artist would do, especially when working in a more three-dimensional format, you know, always got to think about the fundamentals, right? And that's one of the things that I, I encourage uh, the students to do as they sort of evolve their piece. Uh, definitely one of the things we'll be doing in my character illustration class. But uh, so like this was a, a demo I did for a class years ago talking about the types of lighting in a, when you have objects grouped together in, a, in an environment, right? You got your different types of shadows, your balance light, all that good stuff. And explaining, you know, with this painting kind of how that works, right? What, how that leads to my decision-making uh, for the execution of this piece, right? Because when I'm working in a more 2D fashion for like children's books, um, or even as a background painter in some of the shows I've worked on, don't have to worry too much about bounce light, about um, crazy shadows. Uh, on the Batman show, we did that. So that show, I, I hope people will really love the, the art direction of it. Um, but in, you know, in a case like this, right, this is sort of like how, um, 
how I think about a piece in terms of, okay, we have the composition, we have the idea, but now we need to execute it. We need to finish it, right? We need to, we need to get it to that final stage. And so, um, you know, but again, it's not like, oh, it, it, it's like, looks finished from the get go, right? It's, it's all about being patient and letting it go through that awkward adolescent phase um, that, you know, I say all paintings have, uh, or at least 99% of them usually have. Uh, sometimes a painting can come together like that. And then in those cases, you know, you just thank the art gods. Um, but, you know, in this case, it's like, okay, I knew what I, I knew kind of like what I wanted from the composition. So just started blocking in color tones. Again, one layer, then it, then it lets me sort of, what I like to do from that is then maybe take like an overlay layer and then just sort of pop, you know, uh, colors and shadows, multiply layer, and then merge that down, keep painting, you know, uh, and then slowly start to bring it to life uh, so that we get to the um, to the final. And again, you'll sort of notice that like the the even like the composition of the trees and the foliage in the background changes a little bit because like as it was evolving from here to here, I thought, oh, there's too much complexity back there. Like too many near misses, too many close tangents. So I'm just going to, uh, one, change it so that the background is a lot cooler, popping him to be more warm, and then uh, uh, making the head, making the background simpler so that the head reads a lot easier. So ultimately, uh, as an, at, a, at, a, at a bird's eye view, right, going back to this piece, um, this is essentially how I work. This is kind of how I bring bring a piece to life, right? Rough sketch, you know, uh, worrying about the big, you know, taking each problem at each step, right? What's the concept? What's the story? And then, uh, you know, for me, I, I typically don't necessarily go straight to black and white. I might go straight to color, but I'm always thinking of value. I always have a black and white adjustment layer at the top of all of my documents so that I can quickly see what my values are. Uh, but of course, for any class or sort of step-by-step um, -step, uh, explanation I'll do, we'll talk about value first since we, since we need to just think about value and then, um, and then worry about color. But you'll notice that like as the piece evolves, right? Like here I drew the background way too small, had to you know, uh, increase it up once you sort of adjust for perspective and scale. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much uh, my, like my, you know, my TED talk about character illustration, about process, about kind of evolving the piece, kind of the things that I look for and what I focus on. I'd be happy to answer any questions, deep dive into any other things um, that uh, anybody wants me to. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much uh, for that. Oh, th thanks for the talk. That was really informative and I learned a lot too. Um, there, there is a question um, up from someone that I thought was uh, really interesting. Um, how did you make the jump from molecular um, biology to illustration and what skills from science uh, was helpful, I guess, in becoming an illustrator? Um, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> well, I guess the, the jump wasn't so much of a direct jump. So I, um, when I was a kid, I liked to draw uh, but, you know, w when I grew up, it wasn't like known what an artist could do. Like, I think I, I was just like, OK, there's comic book artists and then there's Disney animators. And I never thought I like I didn't think I could be that. Not that anybody discouraged me, but it just sort of felt like, oh, that's impossible. It's like saying I want to be like like LeBron James or like about like, a you know, a, a, an athlete. Um, uh, so I just never thought seriously about art, went went through, you know, school high school and then in high school I liked science so I thought oh I really like science so let me study that in college so I went uh studied molecular biology thinking I was just going to work in a lab somewhere uh doing science stuff and then uh once I started working in a lab in college like doing basically the 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 lab the university um uh parallel for internships right I was working in labs I realized like this I'm not cut out for this. Like, like it's one thing to like like science, to like learning science, to like just appreciating science. And it's another thing to actually like do it. And I'm like, whoa, this is not for me, right? It's like sort of like thinking like, oh, I, I like helping people, but being a doctor, 
you know, you got to work with blood. You got to, and, and then with science, it's like you have to. It's just you, your life has to be science. And I realized I didn't want my life to be science. So, so I, um, I graduated, and I was like, well, what am I going to do? So I just was working in a biotech company, you know, just doing like quality control stuff, just like very, very menial tasks, like just doing like putting little chemicals into these things and just maybe writing down whatever the results were and passing it off day in and day out and then that sort of boredom though i guess it was good that i that i had that job because i was like really bored like i had no idea what i was going to do with my life and so then i started like sketching again just like for fun because like um uh i just was like you know i had a lot of downtime too while i was waiting for stuff to happen with the chemical things that i was doing so I would sit at my bench and I would just start drawing. I guess this was way before a uh, smartphone. So it's good that I didn't have a smartphone, I guess, now that I think about it. Um, and so then I started sketching and then little by little, I thought, you know, hmm, maybe I can like, like this isn't a career. I don't want to be doing this job for like, the rest of my life. I'm like, what if I like give art school a real shot? So then I, um, I, I, I said, okay, like I'm going to, take a year take art classes and back then there was no warrior art camp there was no any of the online schools it was just real art schools like brick and mortar art schools and nothing else um like i even remember going to barnes and noble to look for a book on like how to draw or how to paint and like it was like nothing it was like like some like oh how to draw comic characters but they were like it was like the most like thing you'd want to give like your eight-year-old cousin as a gift like it wasn't anything like what you could buy now what's available now so um so I I I went to art center and I took a bunch of art center at night classes and then I spent a year taking figure drawing learning acrylic painting um and then made a portfolio uh, applied and to my surprise I got in and so then I decided I would keep going until like like I genuinely thought going into art school that I'm like, like I would like somehow not fail out, but reach a point where I'm like, okay, yeah, this is like, I can't keep doing this. Like this was a serious, this is a serious hobby, nothing more. But thankfully I was able to keep going further. Um, so that's how, it, that's how my transition happened from science to art and, and how science affects or influences and helps now. I would say, I don't necessarily know if the science education helps, but it's more the fact that my mind that likes science, like I think minds, brains that like science, that like sort of analytical disciplines. What's great about that with concept art is it's the same thing. It's problem solving. It's like, that's, that's one of the things that I didn't know about science was I thought science was like, Oh, you learn about the body and physics or like, you know, like, like nature. But what scientists do is they have a problem and they have to think, okay, well, how do we solve that? We have to come up with unique experiment ideas. And like, what if we take this protein from this part of a cell and what if we fuse it with this other protein? And then we, and then that does this and that. And it's like, it's, it's, it's like, um, it's a level of puzzle solving that I'm like, my brain couldn't comprehend. But then when, uh, when I started doing art, I realized, oh, concept art, you know, even illustration uh, is problem solving. It's one of the reasons why I like teaching a lot is because, you know, I'm able to sort of see the, um, what a student is doing and what they need to do to achieve their goal, right? Whether it's like, oh, this is the thing you're doing that's not so helpful or, you know, oh, you want to get better at this? Well, do this exercise, do this like once a day or as many times as you can and you'll get better at this aspect of your, um, of your, uh, your education. Because that's what you know the scientific mind is, right? It's sort of like taking something beautiful like the universe, like life, and deconstructing it into like understandable processes. And uh, and so you know, in, uh, you know, in art school, I'm sure um, most of the people watching this uh, have had this experience where you have a really good artist you like, you know, and 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 this happened at Art Center too great artists but not so great teachers right it's almost like what they do and what they know is so intuitive that um that it's hard for them to explain it and to sort of dumb it down for for uh people who need it to be dumbed down like me like so um 
So for me, I feel like that's that's how it's helped me in my career, both as a teacher as well as a as well as an artist. Because even working with art directors and creative directors, producers, like I'm able to sort of like understand what they want. They'll say like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll submit my work. They'll and and oftentimes I'm working with people who aren't artists, right? They're they're more admin, they're producers, they're not art directors, um, and they'll tell me this needs to feel more. And they'll use some descriptive word, right? Like this needs to feel more exciting or this needs to feel like less this. And that's not, you know, and, and a lot of artists struggle with that. I've, I've seen in some of my coworkers where they're like, I don't know what to do. Whereas like, then you have to think, okay, well, let's deconstruct what the, what's happening, right? You know, are we talking about the pose? Are we talking about, you know, the light? And then, and uh, that's why a lot of, um, at least the, the, uh, people I've worked with really, I feel like enjoy working with me is because I can sort of talk, th I can translate for them and they feel like they can tell me what they want or what they're feeling and then we'll find a real world solution for that art. And so that's how I feel like science has helped me. Um, and, and on the other side, the scientific mind that I have has not helped me or has made it hard because art is about creativity, art is about finding new things that sort of letting go of things. And so sometimes my brain is too focused on, okay, what is the next step I need to do versus sort of trusting that maybe you don't need to know the next step and letting the next step find you, which sounds very poetic. And it's taken me a lot of time to get to that point where I feel comfortable sort of like, like being happy with the frustration. Um, but yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it, there's obviously good and bad to any mindset you can have for anything you do. Anyways, long, long explanation for that. But uh, that, yeah. that's a really good uh, description. And thanks for sharing. Um, I, I know we only have about 10 minutes left, but I wanted to let you know some people submitted some work in the discord. So okay. um, if you could like share your screen for that. Yeah. Um, and then I also while you're doing that, um, somebody asked a really great question. Um, do you have an agent for your work in children's books or, yes. and do you also have a separate portfolio? Yes. Uh, so yes, for children's work, you definitely need an agent, especially if you're trying to sell your own stories. Like you want to, if you just want to be a children's book illustrator, there are agencies that represent illustrators as a whole. Um, and if you want to publish your own books, like you want to write your own book and draw your own book, then uh, you, uh, I wouldn't, I mean, if you self-publish, you don't need an agent, but if you want to go through the traditional route, um, you you definitely need a, a, an agent for that. And it's actually a lot easier to find uh, an agent in children's books than it is uh, for, uh, for anything, uh, like for other things. Like if there's a, a a tried and true format agents are always happy to receive submissions you find their websites and um you follow their guidelines they'll say like oh please you know submit like this uh so it's it's actually finding a children's book agent the process is easy or it's straightforward of course like getting an agent depends on it's a lot it's a lot of chemistry it's a lot of like you know does the agent like what you're doing do they like your voice you know do they feel like what your, your your idea could be cool, but it could also be very much like um, uh, like not something that they can um, sell, right? And so they'll tell you that. Uh, so, yeah. She said, thank you so much. Uh, illustrating for kids, kids literature seems really fun. Oh, cool, for sure, yeah. And I mean, anybody watching this is welcome to like, you know, find me online and message me any additional questions. Can you see my screen, Photoshop? Yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, I just I just went and copied a few uh, um, since we don't have a lot of time. But yeah, these are these are great. Uh, so um, see the first one, Nessie. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to focus on this one. This is beautiful. Uh, I think um, you know. I mean, since I there's not necessarily any specific questions or, uh, 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 but if there if there is a specific question or something, uh, the artist any of the artists wants to know about the pieces, let me know. Um, yeah, I love it. Like this feels like a, you know, like a, a, a really nice, uh, let me make the background darker so that we can see it great. Um, 
really cool. Uh, you know, my just my first impressions. Love the contrast. Love the like. Love the pose. Uh, reminds me of. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Uh, I mean, it reminds me of, of, of a lot of classical artists, but more more um, more common, like like modern. His name is. Uh, he had a gallery show a few years ago in like uh, Culver City. Oh, I can't. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna struggle with memory. Uh, reminds me of that. Um, but uh, I love the like. I love the pose. I love the like the the, the counter pose. Um, just a couple of things that sort of stick out is uh, I feel like a little bit of the um, anatomy is uh, a little astray where, so like, um, right, so if like she, her head's perfectly in profile, that's fine. I feel like this shoulder socket, right, if we're assuming the shoulder socket, there's a little, probably a little too um, close for my liking. So like, I, I would almost want to uh, I think you can probably uh, bend this arm a bit and have the shoulder just um, just a little bit, you know, further back. You know, we'll see a little bit of the torso, right? So then you have, so like that would be sort of the arm, um, just to make it. And then also, you you know, uh, it it, it, it it would also help to like um, give more even. Aside from anatomical things, it's, it'll also help give like a little bit more dimensionality to the piece. So it's like, you know, if if if, she, if her face, if her head is a box and her box is like super in profile and then the torso is another, you know, box, right? So then we have this, you know, this action happening. Um, last thing I'll say is like, you know, uh, I've, I've, I've noticed this is like a convention, I think, in some older paintings, like um, classical paintings. So it's not, I, I wouldn't say this is a bad thing, but it's like, oh, I'm, I'm curious if like, you know, how intentional it, it is to have the, the toes just cropped off. Like, you know, like typically, like, you know, I always say to people, the only bad tangent is a tangent that takes the viewer out of the experience of the painting. So um like in this case, I don't, I wouldn't say that this takes me out of the experience. I sort of do notice that I go, huh, interesting. So it's like, I wonder if like, you know, if it's, if it's necessary uh, to have, oops, to have, you know, the toes, you know, to pull, pull the foot back a bit, just to have the toes, you know, the feet fully in frame. Um, that's pretty much it about that one. But I love the color palette. You know, uh, I think from a color point of view, I'd, I'd love to see some of this cool skylight um, touch the top surfaces of, of, of this rock uh, work that she's sitting on so that we get that dimensionality from, you know, top plane, uh, side plane. Uh, I'll move on to uh, the next one. Uh, this one's really cool. Love it. Um, love the dynamic perspective. Uh, you know, love the, the composition. I think, um, I think this works uh, really well for the 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 uh, the the goal of the shot. So um, yeah, uh, I would say like um, you know with with these such a dynamic perspective things, I feel I feel like the um, the 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 tricky thing is to get sort of like like some of the dimensionality to work with the dynamic angles. So. The only thing I'd probably say about this one is, and thank you everybody who shared artwork. I, I really appreciate you being willing to share. Uh, I totally get that it may not be the most comfortable for somebody to just post their art for somebody to talk about. Um, but uh, but yeah, so like in this case, right, one quick thing I would say is like the fact that the guitar uh, ends right here at the edge of the frame, I would like try to pull it back or, you know, really push it. If you're going to go super wavy, really extend it beyond the frame. But like in this case, I would, I think like, you know, the guitar is in essence, like it fits in a box, right? So if the perspective is such that Right, I would sort of like, I feel like I would try to fit it within this frame first and then, and then see about like, you know, really just kind of sort of pushing it 
um a bit so like because like i like the the i like the boots or the the leggings the stockings like that gives me some great perspective and the shadow on the legs that's beautiful i just i feel like it's like it's getting perspective perspective like dimension but then the guitar sort of like flattens it's almost like going into the body versus like feeling like you know the body the guitar should be you know pushed out from the body right here are the legs if if you can see my my uh right so versus like it almost feels like you're drawing it like where the guitar is like doing that um so like yeah that's probably like you know and then i think you know we can sort of apply the same kind of logic to the hand a little bit thinking about it in, in terms of planes it's a little for me the hand is a little get, getting a little too close to the edge of the composition so i'd probably maybe shift the pose over just a bit um and then yeah that's this is the 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 puzzle of composition. You move one thing, you gotta just out of fix. So it's like a, a puzzle that always uh shifts. Um and then last uh I wanna look at this because this is uh you know like very similar to the other character pieces. This is super cool. Um love the colors. Um yeah very 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 beautiful. Um Uh, yeah, don't see anything off right off the bat that feels like, okay, I want to, you know, uh, I think should be, we should adjust for that. I think, um, you know, one of the things that I would sort of say is like, okay, well, you know, looking at the navigator, I always have my navigator open, right? The focus seems to be around the contrast of the legs and the, the waist. So, you know, that's fine. Um, I would, think like you know maybe we can add we can punch up the um the the horizon and i'm almost done punch up the horizon a little bit to like want to separate the sky a little bit but then you know around the character's head maybe give a little bit uh you know more attention so that you know even in the navigator you can see that that slight adjustment just helps the character's silhouette read without like blowing out the character right it's like how do we um you know finesse these things so that we can like uh because a, a good silhouette i think is always good unless you're doing something super intentional like you're having a character with a lot of lost shadows or lost edges um but in this case i think like you know just we, we want to help um every aspect of the character to pop but we definitely don't want you know i i like the idea that the pool of water in front of the character's legs is the brightest we definitely don't want the entire sky right to be uh you know competing um you know maybe you do maybe you sort of go you break it and then you realize oh i like going that far right so that's what I'd say about those three. And I know we're pretty much at time. So I appreciate everybody uh, spending a few extra minutes with me. Well, thank you so much um, for that. I think, wow, like I didn't even notice those little crits. So, so, so good. And you did it like so fast. So really appreciate it. Um, for sure. Yeah. Thank you everybody for submitting. <laughs> thank you. So um, thank you guys for joining um, this talk. And thank you, Mauricio. I hope you guys have a nice holiday. And um, yeah. Yes, happy um, I'll, holidays, everyone. Yeah, I dropped in Mauricio's class link um, into the special event chat if you guys want to find out more information. So uh, check it out and see you guys in the next new year. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. See you next year. <laughs> yeah, cool.